impact maternal mortality. The US has some of the highest maternal mortality rates of any developed country. You'll hear more about these statistics throughout the evening. Each year we lose about 700 mothers. Think about the devastation, the loss to those families. A child is left motherless and, grief and a grieving family must pick up the pieces and while caring for new life, try to heal. It is unimaginable. This month, we've had several showings of a documentary called Toxic, A Black Woman's Story, followed by engaging rich dialogue among the, about the impact on structural racism on maternal health. Honestly, uh, impact on all of our health. Thank you to those of you who did participate. We certainly appreciated and enjoyed your participation. This evening, we are honored to have a panel representing some of the top minds nationally engaging us on this critical subject. You will hear about their incredible credentials and experiences after remarks from our esteemed CEO, Dr. Steffi Mehta. But first, if you want to claim CME credits, for this event, I have to pull my slides up and show you how to do that. Give me just a second. I assume it's not showing, right? Okay, there we go. So of course, uh, distinguished panel discussion and here are our presenters, Dr. Haywood Brown, Dr. Greenfield, Dr. Gillespie, uh, Ms. Deborah Frazier. The objectives at the conclusion of this activity, participants will be able to review statistics of black maternal health in the US, identify factors affecting black maternal mortality, outline initiatives in the US, Louisiana and Arkansas to reduce black maternal mortality. Accreditation and CME for, for this program is provided through University of Arkansas. So accreditation for ACCME and ACPE. You can claim 0.5 credits, AMA, and 0.5 for ANCC. Here are our panelist disclosures. And here is the number and the activity codes to claim your CME. I will put this in the chat for those of you who uh, have not had the opportunity to copy it or if you join late. So from here, I will turn it over to Dr. Mehta. Thank you, Gloria. And thank you for having me uh, make a few opening comments. I'm, I'm deeply honored to be here, but I have to say I'm also profoundly sad that we're having this discussion in 2022. We're, we're here today because maternal mortality is too high and it's getting worse in the United States. Preventable deaths of women during and within the first 42 days after pregnancy, the end of pregnancy, are on the rise in the United States. According to the World Health Organization, while maternal mortality has declined throughout the world in the last two decades, women in low income countries are still 45 to 50 times more likely to die as a result of pregnancy than in high income countries. And to put that into perspective, those high income countries such as in Europe, New Zealand, Australia, the maternal mortality rates range from 1.7 deaths per 100,000 live births in New Zealand to 8.7 deaths in France compared to 480 deaths per 100,000 live births in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in the United States in 2020, the last year with which uh, there are published data, the, the maternal mortality rate was the highest amongst those high income countries with 23.8 deaths per 100,000 live births. And that's up from 20 in 2019 and 17 in 2018. Arkansas has the fifth highest maternal mortality rate in the United States. So we're the richest country in the world and we spend more on healthcare than any other country, yet maternal mortality rate for African-Americans in the United States is 55 deaths per 100,000 live births. Compare that to about 12 per 
100,000 were white American women. African American women are four times more likely to die due to pregnancy than white American women. Why? So maternity morta maternal mortality is a result of many factors, access to healthcare, access to prenatal care, obesity and comorbidities, governmental and community support for resources or the lack thereof, poverty, education, and structural racism. While the proximate causes of death in peripartum period are cardiomyopathy, severe hemorrhage, hypertension, and infection, um, the causes of racial and ethnic disparities in maternal mortality are not limited to education, poverty, and poor access to healthcare. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, college-educated American Black women have a five-four, a five-fold higher likelihood of dying as a result of pregnancy than non-Black other college-educated women. Why? As the toxic, as the film Toxic, uh, Black Women's Stories illustrates so well, racism and its many insidious manifestations is almost certainly one of the leading causes of the higher rate of maternal mortality for African-American women. Implicit bias, structural racism, overt racism, behaviors still exist in our society, and sadly within healthcare. So maybe they have declined over the past 30 years, but they still exist as health disparities based on social inequities show us every day. They shouldn't exist, but they do. Discrimination in all of its forms won't disappear without deliberate, intentional, and focused, and focused efforts. We know how to manage our implicit biases, but dismantling structural and ethnic and racial discrimination is harder. Healthcare practitioners take oaths to care for all in need, regardless of social, economic, racial, or ethnic status. Race, ethnicity, poverty, religion, and education are not biologic distinctions. The last environment we should expect to experience discrimination is in healthcare. The high rate of maternal mortality in the United States is not a black problem. It's an American problem, an American problem born from racism and a lack of political and social will to provide evidence-based care to all pregnant women and all new mothers. UMS embraces our responsibility to reduce maternal mortality in Arkansas. Our 10-year strategic plan specifically commits us to reduce maternal mortality by 40% or more by 2029. We are participating in the national effort joining over 200 academic health systems to reduce maternal mortality. And one of today's panelists, our own Dr. Sam Greenfield, was instrumental in establishing the Arkansas Maternal Mortality Review. I'd like to thank tonight's panelists, Dr. Richard Davis, the UAMS Division for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and the Planning Committee for hosting this event and bringing our attention to these issues. We at UAMS are committed to taking action to reduce maternal mortality at our own institution and across the state. And we will not stop the work until there are no preventable, preventable paternal deaths in Arkansas. There is a lot of work to do. Awareness and understanding are fundamental to the effort. Thank you for joining us today. And I would like to turn over the podium to our incredible and distinguished Amber McCoy Booth from our Division of Diversity equity and inclusion. Amber. Thank you so much, Dr. Mehta. Greetings. My name is Amber Booth McCoy, your favorite diversity specialist, and I am the manager of intercultural education in the US, UAMS Division for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I do want to thank everyone for being here tonight. We're so excited that if we're going to talk about a problem, that we also talk about solutions. And so that's what we're here to do, to talk about solutions, advocacy, and how we make this a community problem and solve it together. In order to do that, we have an amazing panel here with us today. First, we have the amazing Dr. Haywood Brown, um, the Senior Associate Vice President of Faculty and Academic Affairs at the University of South Florida Health, who is additionally the Vice Dean of Faculty Affairs for the Morsani College of Medicine and the former President of the American Association of Obstetrics and Gynecology. 
We have the awesome Dr. Veronica Gillespie, the Senior Site Lead and Section Head of the Women's Services at Oshner's Health Medical um, Director at the Louisiana Pre uh, Perinatal Quality Collaborative and Pregnancy. We have our own, as we said, Dr. William Greenfield, who's a professor at UAMS Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the chair of the Arkansas Maternal Mortality Review Committee. And then the intelligent and wonderful Dr. Uh, Deborah Frazier, who is the CEO of National Healthy Start Association. To the individuals in attendance here with us today, if you have questions for our panelists, if you'll send them to me directly, we'll have the Q&A at the end. But each one of our panelists will have time to discuss how they are contributing to um, in their work, if you will, as it relates to Black maternal mortality nationwide. And so I'm going to kick it over to Dr. Brown. Well. Great, thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, I hope you can see my slides here. I think they're on slideshow. Let's see, there we go. Um, can you see them okay? Not yet. Great, so I'm gonna give you a, a thank you first of all for the introduction uh, that was already given on this topic. And I think we've already covered these statistics, how we have a higher maternal and infant mortality rate than mother, other countries. And it's Dr. interesting Brown, when we Dr. look Brown? at we can't see your we can't see your slides just yet. You can't see my slides? No. Oh my goodness, what's wrong? GRD did it. Okay. Oh, let me uh press your share screen. There we go. There now we you go. can see them, right? Yes. Beautiful. And so we've already covered these statistics. I don't think we need to go through them anymore. One of the things I would like to highlight, however, though. If we look at 20.7 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2017, what I wanna remind you of is we go back to uh, 1950, uh, black maternal mortality was, um, uh, the overall maternal mortality rate was 42 uh, per 100,000. When we look at the statistics recently, the black maternal mortality rate is 42 per 100,000. And so if we look at about 70 years, we really have not really challenged, we have not challenged ourselves at all to have an impact on black infant mortality, which is the same thing as overall maternal mortality that many years ago. So that's what my issues and my concerns are. Now, when we begin to kind of think about the perspective of what causes maternal mortality, we know about hemorrhage, we know about embolism, we know about preeclampsia, we know about sepsis. Uh, the things that I really am most anxiously concerned about as well or the social determinants that we can't do a lot about. You know, we can deal with these things in the hospital and we've done a very good job of decreasing overall obstetric mortality in the hospital. Suicide, homicide, substance abuse, motor vehicle accidents clearly play a major role. And when we talk about preventable deaths, we've already talked about that. And we know that cardiovascular disease, preeclampsia, but one of the things I will say to you is almost all hemorrhage deaths should be preventable. Thank goodness that Jaco has made a decision that they will monitor every hospital who does obstetrics for making sure that they have a hemorrhage chart and protocol and a preeclampsia protocol. Those two things are cookbook for us. And so if we think about equity, it's very important that we do all the things that we need to do, including for thromboembolism and so forth. All of the deaths are really, uh, uh, for the most part, have a degree of preventability except for amniotic fluid emboli. Now, why is this so important? <clears throat> we think about the history, I wrote this paper for the Journal of uh, uh, National Medical Association a few years ago, and Deborah's made with this. You know, we think about enslaved women and their reproduction, how it was manipulated, how it was, uh, you know, we were subject to breeding and husbandry, how the wealthy planters actually use inducements for normal reproduction delivering less stress. What do we know now? Stressors is one of the leading causes of prematurity and maternal morbidity and mortality and cardiovascular disease. So even then, God forbid, as bad as it was, decreasing the stressors lowered the impact on natural reproduction during the periods of the fer fertile period. Enslaved women, however, did control their own food production and fertility with breastfeeding and the use of certain types of roots and so forth and so on. These things were passed on to midwives and passed through families and passed through history and so forth and so on. 
But the other thing that we know is obstetric care was really relegated to uh, the slave owner delegated old slave women and with who gave the maternity care and, 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 and became the midwives. There was no form of training to practice medicine prior to 1820. And so pregnant women received the best medical care on the plantation because of the premium placed on their reproduction. They were the machines that ran the labor workforce, but their work was limited. The wealthier planners called in doctors for complicated pregnancies, those who could afford them. Breastfeeding throughout the first year of life and beyond reduced the likelihood of pregnancy. Uh, these medicinal plants aided in fertility and the menstrual regulation. Marriage and cohabitation was uh, an inducement for normal reproduction and creation of a nuclear family because of less stress. Interestingly, the average age at the first birth uh, during most of the period was about 20.8. The birth rate below five, uh, was below 5% in girls less than 15 years. And the highest first birth was between 15 and 24, obviously. And births were also very seasonal. Here's the problem. Mothers were forced to stop breastfeeding very early so they could return uh, to the fields to do work. In 1920, there was only one black physician for every 3,000 black people compared to one in 500 for white people. Granted, midwives therefore attended the majority of all black deliveries in the former Confederate states. Now, what we saw here is between about 1900, what did we see happening? Beginning in about 1950, as I said to you, this is where we had an overall maternal mortality rate of about 42 per thousand, 100,000. The maternal mortality rate began to drop, the infant mortality rate also began to drop. And now what we've done is we've seen this gradual creeping up again of the maternal mortality rate. What happened in the, in the 1940s? There was a shift from home to hospital births. Maternal mortality dropped by 71%. This, of course, came, uh, occurred later for Black women in Southern states, uh, 1950s or more. And in the mid-1940s, 75% of all births were to, uh, in these Southern states, including Arkansas, were by midwives. My great aunt was a granny midwife in Eastern North Carolina. And my mother used to say about Aunt Maggie, Aunt Maggie knew who she was in trouble. She even knew when to call the doctor, you know? And so it's like, what have we learned? with some of the things that people don't want to do now in order to prevent maternal mortality. One of the biggest factors associated with mortality and perinatal issue is, is, I believe the poverty gap is one of the biggest origins of maternal and infant morbidity and mortality. If you think about the generational stress and its impact on low birth rate, uh, fetal programming, and the thrifty phenotype, and the origin of diabetes, hypertension, and all these chronic diseases and obesity that we talk about. So if you look at anyone with an annual income less than $25,000 or lower educational attainment, the risk for maternal morbidity and mortality is significantly higher. And this is also a factor for black people, for white people as well. And so we have to keep that in mind uh, as we go through and look at what is happening. Now, this is the way it looks. If you're in a poverty rate of 15% or higher, and look at what has happened here, as the maternal mortality, the relative risk of mortality is waxing and waning. If you're below 5%, it's totally different than it is if you are at a uh, you know, 15 or higher or five. So money is still an issue. This is why it's so important for us to expand Medicaid and also extend Medicaid to 12 months of postpartum. If you look at, again, you can pick out Arkansas here, you can pick out certain types of states. Look at how we compare to some other countries. I mean, uh, Deborah, you know, we talk about Louisiana. This is like uh, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Syria. If you look at Georgia, you look at Arkansas, you look at places and look at Florida. We have all these places. And this was just recently published in one of the journals that really kind of got, got my eye when we began to kind of think about where we are with maternal mortality rates and imagine that for black people compared to white people overall. So the uh, states that currently have not expanded Medicaid, I'm proud to say that Georgia, Florida recently extended Medicaid to 12 months postpartum, even though we are not a non-Medicaid expansion state. 
we have a higher maternal and mortality rate than Iran, Libya, Turkey, two times greater risk than Canada. Childbirth is the number one reason for hospitalization in the United States. For every maternal death, there are 50 near misses. These are the type of things that we can correct. And 60% of maternal deaths occur postpartum overall. And Black women die three to four times higher than white women. The reason my focus was on maternal, uh, on postpartum care during my presidency is, is part of it is this reason. Almost all uh, thromboembolic deaths occur within the first three weeks postpartum. And so when we think about that and how we send the patient home and how we begin to kind of make sure that they are followed up appropriately in two weeks and three weeks and so forth, particularly if they've had cesarean deliveries, which increases their risk. But this is a factor. And this is the reason it's so important for us to remodel postpartum care so that we're seeing patients appropriately. This is Art James's slide that we kind of remade uh, looking at 400 years since the first slaves arrived in America. Health disparities are rooted in generational stress in Black women. Generational stress, cytokines release, being the backbone of the family being afraid if your black male child goes out of the house because of fear they may not make it back. Stress, 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 stress. And these are the factors that we know are associated with all of these things. So the whole fetal origins of adult disease, growth restricted babies, undergrown babies, premature babies, having a pattern of diabetes and hypertension and obesity. Uh, these are the factors that we must overcome. Now, this was the American Heart Association President's Advisory looked at it published in circulation in December. Uh, it was really a call to action on racism as a fundamental drive of all health disparities. And you should take a look at this and you should read it because it's very profound. So my conclusions here tonight, generational stress, stresses in black women from slavery to present time, segregation, economic inequality, eugenic sterilizations, quality education, systemic racism in the healthcare access and quality. 50% of all counties are gonna have a practice of OBGYN a midwife in the United States. We have rural obstetric deserts and we have to create certain types of things. I'm proud of the fact that we sponsored the omnibus bill through ACOG and Lauren Underwood got that passed. We're addressing issues affecting maternal mortality and close to social determinants and diversifying the perinatal workforce. We're creating new grant programs for the training of maternal care providers in rural areas, establishing rural obstetric networks, focus on improving maternal health outcomes. We're looking at doulas, postpartum doulas, everything that we can in order to be able to improve outcomes in women. And with that, that is my introduction. I look forward to hearing from my colleagues uh, amidst all of this. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Brown. I'm for that content, that was amazing. And now give it to Dr. Gillespie, Gillespie Bale, excuse me. Thank you. And thank you all for allowing me to be here uh, with you today to discuss something that is near and dear to my heart, uh, maternal mortality um, and especially the racial disparities. Um, as was mentioned, I am the medical director of the Louisiana Perinatal Quality Collaborative, as well as the Pregnancy Associated Mortality Review, um, all here in, in Louisiana. And I'm going to go through kind of what we have been doing in Louisiana to improve birth outcomes um, and to decrease the disparity gap. Um, you've already seen my disclosures, nothing related to the content uh, for today. Um, one distinction that I want to make when we talk about maternal mortality, because there are a couple of different definitions. Um, some mortality reviews review maternal deaths uh, at the time of death up to 42 days at the end of, of, of the pregnancy. Here in Louisiana, we review maternal deaths uh, defined as the death of an individual while pregnant or within one year of the end of pregnancy. And I bring that up for two reasons. One, it makes it harder when you're looking sometimes at the numbers because you're not comparing apples to apples. But also when we look at that entire year, that gives us, as Dr. Haywood was saying, Dr. Brown was saying in his presentation, it gives us a wider view of what's happening to our women. And we're able to see the social determinants of health. And so in this review community, we work to understand those drivers of maternal mortality, 
understand the complications, understand the disparities, and then come up with solutions and then uh, inform the implementation of those initiatives. Um, again, I won't go through this in the interest of time, but when we look at these deaths, we, our big umbrella is the pregnancy associated deaths, so all causes, but then we break that into causes that are related to the pregnancy, not necessarily related to the pregnancy, but occurred in that time frame, and then unable to determine the relatedness. So our most recent report was published uh, in 2021, and it was a review of 2018 deaths. We are working right now on, our, on uh, three years of data looking from 2017 to 2019. So in Louisiana in 2018, we had 55 confirmed deaths, and that gives us a maternal mortality ratio of 92.5 per 100,000 live births. Um, and you've already heard from, from, from Dr. Brown, how that is a, a, huge, uh, a huge ratio. Um, with those deaths, again, looking at the causes, you would be surprised if you are not looking at the whole picture. Our three leading causes of deaths were accidental overdose of substance use disorder, motor vehicle collisions, and homicide. Yes, pregnancy-related deaths are important. So those conditions um, that happen in the hospital are related to the pregnancy, but the majority of the deaths that are happening in our state are from things that are determined by the social determinants of health. The other thing that we see in Louisiana as across the country, doesn't matter how we slice the pie, if we're talking about those pregnancy associated deaths, which again is a big umbrella, pregnancy related, it doesn't matter, we have a disparity. I really like this slide because I think it gives a bit nice visual uh, picture of what we're seeing for the, those disparities. So in 2018, black uh, births accounted for 37% of the births, but 58% of the deaths. So again, black, black individuals, black families, black women are disproportionately experiencing maternal mortality. And if we're going to address maternal mortality, if we're gonna address dis disparities, no matter what the disparity is, we have to address implicit bias and systemic racism. That is the root of all of our health disparities in health and healthcare. As we go through it, I mentioned we make recommendations, and I, I won't go through each of these, but we, when we do our reports, we do them in several areas, or recommendations in several areas. Um, systems, what systems need to improve, what clinical quality needs to improve, social support, what policy changes need to happen. And then for those of us that are in public health, what are the research needs, what, what needs to, to happen from a communication standpoint to the public about what is, what is happening. And I show this slide just to say, if we're going to decrease maternal mortality, it takes all of us. It's not just what's happened, what we can do in hospitals. It's not just what we can do as legislators, as universities. It is all of us working together. With those nine overarching themes, um, improving care coordination before, during, after pregnancy. Uh, Dr. Brown, you know you were the first one to coin that fourth uh, trimester. We have to stop thinking about pregnancy as something that ends six weeks after we, after we deliver. That time between delivery to the next pregnancy is a crucial time for interventions to improve our outcomes. We have to ensure that patients get to the right care based on the level of complexity and severity of their, of their medical issues. We have to expand the workforce. That means including cardiologists, psychiatrists, addiction specialists, um, and in, in, in include expanding that workforce, that also means diversifying the, the workforce. workforce. Um, we have to improve and expand that identification and treatment for substance use during pregnancy. Um, we have to address racial and cultural bias. Um, and Dr. Brown already talked about it with implicit bias across the network that cares for pregnant and postpartum women. So that means not just physicians or nurses, but everybody in public health, in our policymakers, in our insurance providers, our payers. And we have to promote community health and social services by addressing the social determinants of health and violence prevention. Um, you know, now you've seen it in my slides and in Dr. Dr. Uh, Brown's slides, but uh, homicide was one of the leading causes of maternal death. I have done a, a, another study um, outside of just looking at Louisiana data, looking at the national data uh, with one of my colleagues at Tulane, and we found across the United States that the rate of homicide in pregnant individuals from 2017 to 2019 was higher than that in the general population. And we know that intimate partner violence is a huge part of that, and we still see, and we see the dis disparities uh, where Black women are more affected as well. 
And then I will always, always be an advocate for data. In Louisiana, we use data for action. And so we need to make sure that maternal mortality review committees have access to all of the data that they need, medical records, autopsy reports, uh, coroner's reports, police reports. We use all of that information to try to have a more holistic view of those deaths to understand where those areas of prevention are. And then I'll slip through these. Um, and so what we're doing in Louisiana around this um, to address maternal mortality um, is again, these, these themes that you've seen, we have worked to update our maternal levels of care so that they are consistent with the national guidelines, um, making sure that our hospitals are, are, no matter if they are in New Orleans or if they're down in Homa, where we have not as many providers or we have lower levels of hospital, low, uh, hospitals that have a lower level of care, a lower acuity, that they are prepped and prepared for those leading causes of pregnancy related deaths. And then we um, have created a Louisiana doula registry board, hoping to get the board in place and then make sure that our doulas are covered under Medicaid. Right now, our doulas are only uh, accessible to those who can pay for them. Um, but we do have programs like Healthy Start in Louisiana uh, or in, in, in New Orleans in particular that's helping to, to um, subsidize the cost of doulas. But we know how important doulas are for care in terms of being patient advocates and especially for our, our Black mothers, our Black and Brown mothers. Um, but right now, because they're not covered by insurance, we have furthered that disparity in who is able to access them. Um, we have an initiative to improve the care for the substance exposed dyad. We've created um, something called the birth ready designation I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and then we have um, also created a domestic uh, uh, abuse fatality review committee. Um, so again, we always believe in data to action. So the data part that I'm in charge of is our PAMR, our mortality review. And then the action part is our perinatal quality collaborative. So our perinatal quality collaborative is made up of public health advisors, myself, um, a team that works with our birthing facilities to make sure that they are using improvement science to implement best practices. The data shows it takes about 17 years for something to go from translational research to actually being put into practice at the bedside. If you use improvement science, that goes to three. We have right now 43 of our 49 birthing facilities as part of the Perinatal Quality Collaborative covering 95% of the births in Louisiana. And again, this um, picture here is just showing what we do with our teams um, using that improvement science just to see what outcomes look like and why change is possible. Um, we launched the Perinatal Quality Collaborative in August 2018, and our first initiative was aimed at reducing severe maternal morbidity from hemorrhage and hypertension by 20% by May 2020, as well as narrowing the Black-White disparity gap. I think it's hugely important that we do not think about equity as a secondary thing. Um, one of the things that was very unique about our quality collaborative, and we got a lot, a lot of um, negative responses. Um, we never, we always included equity from the beginning. We said we were not gonna do this if we were not gonna be working on improving outcomes for everyone. When I say we got negative responses, and some people have heard me talk about this before, when we were in our second learning session with our birthing facilities, um, and this was in October of 2018, we were talking about health disparities, health equity, trying to normalize the language just to help our teams to understand. We had two teams that walked out of our presentation, like not during the break, in the middle of our presentation because they felt offended by the conversation that we were having. So we had some very hard ground that we had to till and sow to plant these seeds to start getting change. Um, now, what we did see in our, uh, for our results, we decreased the severe maternal morbidity from hemorrhage by 35% and by 49% for black women. Um, severe hypertension, we didn't get exactly where we wanted to go. We decreased it by 12% and we actually saw an increase um, by 8% for black women. Prior to the pandemic, though, that reduction was 22%. We now know um, that having COVID-19 is an independent risk factor for developing a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. So I do think that affected our results. Um, but um, we, this is testimony that change is possible when you are intentional about that change. 
When we see our process measures, we saw uh, for the things that we are asking our hospitals report on, risk assessment on admission went up by 78%. So assessing a, an individual's risk for a hemorrhage went up by 78% quantifying blood loss, measuring blood loss at delivery went up by 172%. And timely treatment of hypertension, making sure that patients that have a hypertensive disorder, they're getting treated within 60 minutes of that first blood pressure increased by 211%. This is huge. Now it's gonna be a while before we see these results in our mortality see, to see it improve, but it's going to improve. Mortality is the tip of the iceberg, and that should not be what we're aiming to. We do want to make sure we're not having having deaths, but for every mortality, there are a thousand events of morbidity. And so, these process measures and improving these processes improve the morbidity and will eventually improve the mortality. I am particularly excited by seeing this increase in timely treatment of hypertension because we know that hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are increasing at a rate higher than that of chronic hypertension in the general population. And so we need to have a, a focus on hypertension uh, in addition to the long-term sequelae for uh, individuals that do have a hypertensive disorder in, in, in pregnancy. The other thing that we, that we did just to talk about where we, have, where we started and where we've come from, we created something called the Louisiana Birth Ready Designation. And so this is a designation that we give our hospitals through the LAPQC if they meet certain outcomes and certain metrics. And that is reporting to us, they have to perform at a certain level for uh, different measurements and outcomes. But I think what is most important for what we're talking about, in order to get this designation, they have to be participating in implementing something that addresses equity. Uh, we give them a menu to choose from. It can be implicit bias training of all of the providers. It can be implementing the um, maternal mistreatment index. Um, it can be using patient feedback to make a change that improves equity. So we went from not being able to even have, me being able to say the word, uh, racism or implicit bias to now all of our teams working on it. Um, so I think that's a huge amount of change. Um, Dr. And, Gillespie, mm -hmm. I'm saying, but I have to just, but I have to yeah. catch, yes. Yeah, this is my last slide. Um, <laughs> so, and, and again, just to summarize, um, if we're going to address equity, we have to make sure we're centering patients' voices, diversify that the workforce, because we know that when there's concordance of a race that we do have better outcomes. And we have to think about bringing care to the patient instead of bringing patients to the care to address our social determinants of health and change is possible. And I will stop there and I'm looking forward to the questions. Me too. I am um, excited about the interprofessional teams that you spoke of and the work that is being done. So we're gonna pass it on to Dr. Greenfield so he can give us an Arkansas view as well. Sam, if you're talking, you're muted. Okay, are my slides visible to the group? Yes. yes. Okay, very good. So um, it's been interesting to follow these two dynamic speakers because the work that they have done, you'll see the information that I present will be very similar. Uh, we are, uh, say, a few steps behind where Dr. Brown was and about a step or so behind where Dr. Gillespie is in terms of what Arkansas has done. But uh, what I want to do is give a tighter view of what's happening in Arkansas in terms of our efforts to address uh, this topic. So as we mentioned, Arkansas, we rank 46 out of 50, uh, with 50 being the worst in terms of maternal mortality. So certainly a way to go. You can see the blue states here, the deep blue states in color in terms of where the maternal mortality uh, is the highest. Uh, in 2019, Arkansas was active in getting two uh, pieces of legislation passed. And this is interesting as a clinician, I didn't think I fully appreciated the role of the political uh, aspects of medicine uh, and how important it is to be effective and to get certain things done. And these two acts led to the formation of Maternal Mortality Review Committee and the Perinatal Outcomes Quality Review Committee, which is essentially functioning as our PQC. And that has uh, been developed and it continues to move forward. With our Maternal Mortality Review Committee, there are really three broad questions in terms of scope and purpose. One, 
we were looking to review all of those pregnancy associated deaths, identify and characterize maternal deaths, and then identify and recommend prevention solutions. And so to those who are not familiar with the language, what we we're talking about is the umbrella, pregnancy associated deaths being that broad ca category of all deaths. Pregnancy associated but not related would be, um, was the person pregnant, uh, but and, and they died within one year, but it was not necessarily related to the pregnancy with why they died. For example, did a, did a tornado hit their home and there was a tragedy there? Or was it a pregnancy related death? Did something unique to that pregnancy lead to a series of events that that patient subsequently died? And as we mentioned, uh, there are those that are medical conditions and those that are a little bit more vague and, and difficult, intimate partner violence being one, we see higher rates of that uh, in, in our pregnant population. Uh, so that is something where the committees actually begin to ask very specific questions about what's actually going on. And there are really six key decisions that the committees are looking to make uh, for each decision. Was that death pregnancy related? What was the underlying cause of death? Was the death preventable? What were the critical contributing factors to the death? What are the factors, I'm um, sorry, what are the recommendations and actions that address those contributing factors? And then uh, more specifically, what is the anticipated impact of those actions if implemented? So that's really what the work of the committee comes down to. In the state of Arkansas, we have a multidisciplinary committee that includes uh, community uh, uh, advocates. We have a number of clinicians. We have a number of non-clinicians on the committee as well. And I think it's important to understand that it's not um, a, a group of physicians sitting around reviewing deaths uh, in the form of a traditional M&M &M where we're looking at the um, impact of what happened just within the hospital. You know, one, one of our colleagues on the, on the team um, is, is, uh, is an EMS, is on the EMS board. And it's interesting because you know the hospitals are involved and the ambulance services involved, but for many of us, you know, what is what exactly is the role of ambulance service? What's the impact of what they do? What's the time? What's a reasonable time for them getting to the patient and them getting to the hospital? All of these types of questions that we we benefit from having a multi, having a multidisciplinary committee involved. So we started with the review of deaths in 2018, reviewing the deaths in 2018. We had a little bit of a delay due to the pandemic, and we uh, navigated that just like everyone else with moving to virtual meetings. But in 2018, which is our first complete year year of maternal deaths that we reviewed. We had 36,896 live births. We had initial, initial pregnancy associated deaths identified and reviewed by the staff were 40 out of that 36,000. And then the pregnancy associated deaths reviewed by the committee were down to 30. We had 12 pregnancy related deaths, 13 pregnancy associated, but not related. And then we had about five that were associated, but we really were not able to determine what the relatedness was. And what we found is information that is consistent with what other committees has found as well. Pregnancy associated deaths by race and ethnicity. For all pregnancy associated deaths, black mothers were more than twice as likely, 2.3 times as white mothers uh, in Arkansas. You can see the breakdown of pregnancy associated deaths by race and ethnicity in Arkansas. 37% were black, non-Hispanic, 53% were white, non-Hispanic. And you can see the breakdown 7% Asian and 3% Hispanic. If we looked at for all pregnancy associated deaths, black mothers we mentioned were 2.3 times as likely. And we mentioned standardizing the number against a, a, a ratio of 100,000 to make sure that we're speaking the same language. If you were to look at the pregnancy associated mortality ratio by race and ethnicity per 100,000 births in Arkansas in 2018, that rate for black non-Hispanic women was 152 per 100,000. For white non-Hispanic, white non 66.2 per 100,000. So both numbers are definitely uh, room for significant amounts of improvement, but the disparity uh, is, is stark as well. And so again, this is just stating that we had the disparity that persisted. We had the breakdown of pregnancy related deaths uh, in terms of uh, that relatedness was 40% pregnancy associated, but not related, it was 43%. And then out of those that we were unable to determine relatedness, those five deaths represented 17%. And, uh, you know, as we go through the questions, you know, we can talk about what, why we were unable to determine relatedness, but it really gets to a question of, you know, if you, if someone committed suicide, was that exact, was that exacerbated by the fact that they had depression that was not addressed or adequately addressed during the time of their pregnancy? First thing, was the question asked? Second thing, the question was asked, the question was properly answered, did they have a place to go? 
Were they impaired by the fact that they were in a rural setting and didn't have access to care? Were they impaired by the fact that they got past uh, 60 days and there was no more uh, uh, you know, financial support to get them to the, to the provider that they need? And as Dr. Brown mentioned, a significant number of these deaths occur beyond the, the time with which we typically think of a routine postpartum visit, which is uh, set at six weeks in the history of that. It's perhaps beyond the scope of this, but that's an interesting consideration as well. Interesting, when we looked at insurance type in 2018, 44% of the women who died from pregnancy associated but not related deaths that occurred after delivery had Medicaid compared to 67% who died from pregnancy related deaths. So in another way, pregnancy related deaths, which are the ones that pregnancy is a factor that is you know, cause and effect or causal in effect. Um, those pregnancy related deaths have occurred at a poor rate, they were 67% of the deaths. So there's a, a consideration there back to supporting the fact that there are economics in play with all of this. And it's really interesting because these things, it's really been interesting with the presentations because we talk about economics, is economics a proxy for access to healthcare? Is economics a proxy for uh, historical uh, inequities that have persisted in terms of generational wealth transfer, access to care? All of these things play a significant part. If you look at our pregnancy-related breakdown of uh, by, by race and ethnicity, you can see pregnancy-related mortality ratio. The numbers are better than pregnancy-associated. That's to be expected. But nonetheless, the disparities persist with that rate being significantly higher in African American women compared to the white counterparts, with that rate being 55.6 per 100,000 live births in Arkansas. Uh, if you were to look at the specific deaths in terms of what occurred, and on this slide, as opposed to the other slides, and I should have included it, when we talk about homicide, suicide, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, homicide, suicide, and motor vehicular accidents, I don't have that on here, but as, in, as has been previously presented, those were the ones that were, there. they are higher. Those numbers are at the top and those are frequently the ones that have been excluded. But in terms of top underlying causes of pregnancy related deaths, uh, cardiovascular conditions, hemorrhage, cardiomyopathy, uh, cerebral vascular accidents, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy and infection. Now we only have one year's worth of data. And every time I give this presentation, my epidemiologist starts to pull a hair out because it's only one year's worth of data. We will be completing our review of 2019 deaths at our next meeting in a few weeks. And then once we get to our uh, three year um, uh, grouping of data, we'll really be able to see where our trends are. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm I feel fairly confident that they will go as the rest of the country has gone. This was perhaps, I think, the thing that was most striking. When we asked the question, you know, was this death preventable? And this is an interesting question because when we asked it that question, is it preventable? In a clinical setting, most of the time people want to go to, was there an event in the hospital that led to that death being preventable? Was there a, an event within that care? But if you really think this thing broadly, you know, from the onset of the pregnancy, from was this a planned pregnancy? Did they desire to be pregnant uh, through the course of their prenatal care, through the course of their postpartum care and beyond? Whatever series of events that led to that death, you know, was there some chance to prevent that? And we found that 92% of our pregnancy related deaths were potentially preventable. That number is stark and it is uh, shameful that that is a failure, not just on the medical system, but I think it's a, it's a failure as uh, on our country and as a society. So there is definitely room for improvement. Uh, what we did make with our report that is available on our website, a number of recommendations, and I won't read all of these in the interest of time, but I'm just showing a snippet of what the recommendations are and where they are targeted. Recommendations can go towards effort to improve quality improvement, which has been discussed earlier. Efforts can be uh, directed toward improving patient and family uh, engagement. We found on a number of cases when uh, EMS arrived, no one was even administering CPR. So there was an op there's an opportunity. What are the systems of care that are in place? Can there are there systems of care? Are there things that we can do to address mental health and substance use disorders? Um, those are some examples. Um, we can do things to help to improve our maternal death review process. For example, we have a prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, however, even though we have legislation that is in place to allow us to get access to uh, patient medical records, we currently can't get access to prescription drug monitoring uh, reports. So there are things that we can do to actually improve uh, 
our information and it will help to guide us in our decision making and our recommendation process. And then again, you know, as a gynecologist, everything sort of comes back to um, did this patient plan to be pregnant or did she want to be pregnant in the first place? Um, and if they did not and we had a death, then that is a tragedy on top of a tragedy. So what are there, are there things that we can do to improve access to effective contraception? So in summary, this is a fact sheet that summarizes the Arkansas experience in 2018. Our pregnancy associated deaths per 100,000 live births in total was 81. Our pregnancy related deaths per 100,000 live births were 33. Uh, we had 92% of those deaths we redeemed uh, preventable. Uh, we had a 2.2 times uh, disparity of African-American women compared to uh, white women. And you can see the breakdown in terms of when the deaths occurred while pregnant, postpartum, and up to one year. So all target-rich environments for improvement. Where we are right now, in some ways, I see this as a medical last mile. If we were talking commerce and, and, and Amazon, we're trying to figure out how to get the product to the, to the home. I see it as a medical last mile problem. How can we get the information to everyone that needs it, not just healthcare providers, not just to the interested people who show up on a Zoom, but this is a Hear Her campaign that CDC is pushing and we are in full support of and trying to get this information in digestible format, not just to healthcare providers, but to patients as well. So with that, I thank you and I will turn it over to Ms. Frazier, I believe is next. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Greenfield. Our overview and Ms. Frazier, yeah, there she is. Thank you. Um, and I am, I am going to go through this very quickly so that we can um, try to get close to back on schedule. Um, and, and I was asked to talk a little bit about what the National Healthy Start Association is and what our Healthy Start programs do. And so just in a nutshell, we are, um, we work with the Maternal Child Health Bureau and the federal government to um, there are a number of, of programs that work with infant and maternal morbidity and mortality around the country, but we are the signature program that works with communities. And I say with communities, not at communities, but we are community-driven, community-based program, community-driven being the operative word. So we're in 101 locations. We have two tribal nations. 25% of our portfolio is rural. And we have an Appalachian project, one in Puerto Rico, DC, and a project in Northwest Arkansas that serves the Marshallese population. And we've talked a lot about um, infant and maternal mortality. So to be eligible for a healthy start, communities have to have an infant mortality rate of at least one and a half times the national average. Our last cohort of funded projects started out with infant mortality rates of probably close to two times the national rate and at the end of their funding period had a collective infant mortality rate of 4.4. So that tells you something about um, the success of the Healthy Start approach working um, directly with communities leading the way for it. Um, we serve predominantly communities of color because communities of color um, suffer the greatest disparities in both infant and maternal mortality. I'm gonna stop for a minute just on this one slide because this is one that our Maternal Child Health Bureau director um, uses a lot, and I love his analogy. Um, infant mortality, we've not talked about a lot on this, on this call. We've focused a lot on maternal mortality. Infant mortality has decreased over the last few years, but we, sh we, shouldn't, we shouldn't forget about the number of infants who are dying. And, and Dr. Greenfield called the maternal mortality rate um, a medical failure, but it really isn't. Um, neither is infant mortality. It really is a, a societal and a moral failure. Um, is, is, um, as Dr. Warren pointed out, if, if we had a jumbo jet that crashed once a week with 400 people, after, after a couple of months, this country was shut down flying planes and called for a national investigation. It would be a, a huge public outcry. Yet that's how many babies die in this country every year. And when you think about the fact that about two and a half times as many black babies die as white babies die, put that into perspective. And then I'm gonna go on to the next slide. We should really have an, a national outcry about that. And for Arkansas, 
um, regardless of race, regardless of year, you have an, a huge disparity in the number of infants who are dying across your state. Um, the approach that the Healthy Start program takes um, is listed on this slide, as you can see, not much under healthcare. Most of it is around, um, it validates what the previous speakers have talked about. It's really all about addressing those social determinants of health that moms and families need. And I say families because we mostly work with moms, but we also include the fathers because um, research has shown that a supportive partner and father can help improve birth outcomes and improve um, outcomes for moms as well. But we work very closely with, um, with the clinical provider for the mom. And we, we offer, as Dr. Gillespie pointed out, um, supporting doula services. And we also um, pay for additional clinical services with nurse midwives and clinicians in all of our Healthy Start sites. Um, and we have a tremendous success with breastfeeding, um, safe sleep practices, smoking, and we do. Um, as we talk about uh, maternal violence, something that um, Dr. Brown and I have been following very closely. Um, this next slide is on AIM-CCI, which I'll talk about in a second. But we have been following what Dr. Greenfield and Dr. Gillespie just alluded to, the increasing um, number of homicides to women during the pregnant and postpartum period. Um, but one of the things we do in Healthy Start is make sure we do a screening for interpersonal violence. Um, in addition to our depression screening um, during pregnancy and immediately postpartum and follow-up as well. Screening is no good without follow-up. We are fortunate to have a um, AIM Community Care Initiative. So much of what you've heard about, about um, maternal mortality is, is what happens at the community level. And so that's where we are. Um, Dr. Gillespie talked about um, the um, bundles that occur that she works on in hospitals. And what we are doing now, there's been great success at hemorrhage bundles and C-section bundles at the hospital level. So with that success, we're building on that. And we're doing community-based bundles, working collaboration with um, outpatient providers and non-hospital settings um, to come up with evidence-based practices that we know works and putting those evidence-based practices together in what's called a bundle and having all of those outpatient providers to implement those bundles, those evidence-based practices with fidelity and, as Dr. Gillespie pointed out, measuring the outcomes um, and waiting for the improvement. And I've learned a lot just talking to Dr. Gillespie and then hearing her today, and I'm certainly encouraged by the success um, that she's had in Louisiana. Um, so again, more about the, um, the postpartum bundles. And the first bundle that we're doing is the postpartum care basics, um, looking at the period from um, delivery until the, mother, until the child is a year old. And just as, and it's interesting to hear Dr. Gillespie's approach to what, um, to, to equity, because we started this saying, we will not do this without equity. And when we talk equity, we mean every person, not the physician, not the nurse, every person, as Dr. Brown says, from the, the front desk person who greets the patient, we can have the best physician, uh, the best nurse, but if the front desk person is not is not treating the patient well, then we may never see that patient again, whether she's pregnant or whether she's, we're waiting for her to come back for her postpartum visit. So what we're asking every one of our collaborative partners in AIM CCI is to implement um, what we're calling our REALS, our Racial Equity Learning Series. It's a six module, um, a six module um, learning series that addresses racial equity. And we think we, we know we have to lead with equity because as we look at the new CDC um, outcomes, maternal mortality has increased across the board for all races, but it's increased the most for women of color. And it, it is a moral outrage. And if we're going to address it, we do have to lead with equity. We can't be timid about it. 
So as Dr. Gillespie said, they can walk out the room, they can do whatever they need to do, but we have to leave this with equity. So our SAMRAC tool is a self-assessment tool. It's between the individual and their computer. They just answer a few questions and it kind of gives them a gauge of where they are, what they're thinking around equity and their own thinking around bias. So this racial equity learning series is absolutely free because we want everyone to use it and to have it. It is now part of our personnel policy for every employee. Um, and it moves from your personal transformation to your organizational transformation and then leads to um, organizational conversations and then to systemic change um, within your organization and hopefully within your community. Um, and there are CEs built into it for physicians, nurses, and everyone else. So these are places where we're implementing our AIM CCI. And now that we've given you a lot of information about maternal mortality, about disparities, about infant mortality, um, where are you going to go and what are you going to do with all this information? Be called to action. So um, those of you who have seen um, the film Toxic, or if you're familiar with um, any of the conversations, any of the news media that you've seen, there are lots of microaggressions um, and racism itself. So any racial equity learning, the, the racial equity learning series I just mentioned is going to be launched next week. It's absolutely free. The CEs are an added bonus. There are 10 CEs uh, 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 attached to it. Um, Dr. Brown mentioned the, um, the Momnibus Act that um, Dr. Um, Congressman um, Lauren Underwood introduced. It passed the House, got stuck in the Senate. So you can get your congressman to get behind that. Um, you can work with your state legislators. And Dr. Greenfield mentioned the Hear Her campaign. You can certainly get behind that. And for all those states that extended postpartum coverage, there are 34 of them listed here. Yeah. And they're the ones that did not. And there you are, Arkansas. We so you work can, on it though. Yep, you can get behind your state legislators and get that passed. And I'm done, Amber. No, thank you so much. Um, to you. <laughs> I think that what you have shown, if anything, is that there is so much conversation to have and that this can't be the last time that we have it because we have such amazing presenters with such amazing content. I would stay here all night, but I know that y'all are extremely busy and have places to go. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Gloria Richard Davis. And we do thank everyone for being here. Wow, what amazing presentations. I want to thank all of our distinguished panelists and to our moderator for a thoughtful discussion about this critical issue in our state and our nation. I want to thank Dr. Mehta for his opening uh, welcoming remarks. UMS partnered with the Little Rock chapter of the Lynx and National Healthy Start to form a maternal mortality planning committee which brought these presentations to you. Um, I wanna thank all of our committee members, uh, Alicia Aroche, Amber Booth McCoy, Kate Franks, Deborah Frazier, Penny Ward, and uh, Odette Woods. March was our kickoff, however, our work continues. Please look to UMS announcements or visit our Little Rock chapter of links.org website for more information. As Frazier outlined our call to action for our healthcare community, I would say we must work to dismantle structural racism. We need to check our own implicit biases and support more health disparities research. And with that, this concludes our program. And I so appreciate all of you participating and hanging in there with us to the bitter end. Thank you. <laughs> Not the bitter end. It was a sweet end. It was a sweet end. Sweet end. Okay. <laughs> sweet end. Yes.